here's a quote-by-quote -quote guide to the play Bold Girls by Rona Munro. Number one. It's furniture that's bald with age. This is mentioned in the stage directions before a word has been spoken on stage, immediately introducing the audience to one of the challenges that the bold girls face in their everyday lives, namely poverty. The use of the word bald suggests that the fabric on the chairs or sofa is bare of fibres. It is old and worn, but Marie has no money to replace them. Because, as the audience will soon discover, she has been widowed and is a single mother bringing up two children on her own. Number two. Sure, he was hardly here when he was alive. Cassie says this about Marie's late husband, Michael, when she and her mother, Nora, are discussing Marie's reluctance to go out, even though Michael has been dead for some time. Cassie's reference to Michael not spending much time with Marie, even before he died, hints to the audience that he was not necessarily a good husband. It also foreshadows the revelation that Cassie knows from personal experience precisely the sort of things Michael got up to when he wasn't with Marie. Number three, the sky's full of rain and the sound of the helicopter. I want to get inside. These lines, spoken by Deirdre, almost as a stream of consciousness, are useful in highlighting two aspects of the play. By mentioning the helicopter, Deirdre is reinforcing the setting of the play in Belfast during the conflict in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles. The words, I want to get inside, underline Deirdre's isolation and her yearning to belong. She wants to be inside the flat where the woman who was married to her late father lives, along with her two half-brothers. This is what motivates Deirdre to knock on the door. Number four. There is a thunderous knocking at the front door. This stage direction marks an important moment in the play, as it heralds the arrival of Deirdre, the character who is the catalyst for much of the action that follows. At that time, Catholics would assume that a heavy knocking on their door might mean a raid by British soldiers, but this time it's someone unexpected, a young girl of about 15. The word thunderous is effective here, as Deirdre's arrival creates a metaphorical storm in that she will change the lives of the other three women to greater or lesser degrees, significantly in the case of Marie and Cassie, but only temporarily in the case of Nora. Number five. A wee bit of hard truth you could hold in your hand and point where you liked. Deirdre fantasises about having a knife because she once saw a man threaten someone using a knife and demanding the truth. This explains why the knife symbolises truth in the play. It's an object that can be used to make people reveal or face truths. Moreover, just as a knife can hurt a victim, so too the revelation of a truth might hurt those people who are affected by it. Number six. Your daddy was a good man and a brave man, and he did the best he could, and he's in heaven, watching out for you. This line epitomises Marie's self-delusion. The audience hears her say to Cassie that Deirdre looks like Michael, but Marie still pretends to herself that he was a perfect husband and father. She keeps up this facade for her children's sake, but also for her own, as it's the only way she can cope with what has happened to her. It is ironic that she mentions Michael being in heaven, as he may well have been a terrorist and she later learns he has cheated on her with Cassie and with Deirdre's mother. He's no saint, but she tries to convince herself that he was. Moving on to scene two, which is set in a local social club. Number seven. The greasy, grinning, beer-bellied smell of him. Wriggling his fat fingers over me like I'm a poke of chips. Cassie has her faults, not least that she slept with her best friend's husband, but when the audience hears her description of Joe, they feel a degree of sympathy with Cassie. The alliterative word choice of greasy, grinning, beer-bellied and fat-fingered emphasises how repulsive Joe is, as does the simile comparing the way he treats her to eating chips. So we can understand why she isn't looking forward to him coming out of prison and back into her bed. Yet Nora, her mother, can't understand this. She thinks that Joe is an all-right husband, as he doesn't beat Cassie, which is what Cassie's father did to Nora. Number eight. Hard white light floods everything. Oh, Jesus, it's a raid. The stage directions for lighting at this point in the play prepare the audience for something dramatic. A police raid on the club. The fact that the light is described as hard 
to highlight the arrival of the police and is then cut at the end of the raid, delineates the duration of the raid and the fact that it is a disturbing, harsh experience for the woman. This, along with the account of the soldiers tramping through Nora's garden elsewhere in the play, exemplifies the way in which the outside conflict, the troubles, affects these women's lives daily. Marie knows what's about to happen because she says it's a raid, which suggests that this experience is familiar to them all. Number nine, I've a man to see about 15 yards of pale peach polyester mix. As we saw in the Bold Girls overview video, Nora sets her standards low when it comes to dreams, and consequently hers is the only one that is likely to be fulfilled in the play because it's more realistic. The alliteration of the letter P in pale peach polyester adds an almost comedic effect, yet with Nora's characterisation depicting her as a woman who focuses intensely on domestic matters, her slightly pathetic dream sounds entirely plausible. Now we move on to scene three, where Marie and Cassie are chatting outside the club, ready to head home. Number 10. He was like my best friend. Marie says these words when describing Michael to a very sceptical Cassie. Cassie's scepticism adds poignant irony to Marie's words, as after Deirdre's comment about seeing Cassie with a man, with him, in a blue car, the audience may well suspect by now that Cassie has been involved with Michael. Marie's idealistic memory of what her relationship with Michael was like hints at what a good relationship between a man and a woman could be like. However, as we're later to discover, the husband she regarded as her male best friend has been cheating on her with her female best friend. Moving on to scene four, when the bold girls have returned to Marie's flat after their night out. Number 11. We were both lying to you for years. This is the dramatic moment when, after they've both been drinking and tongues are loosened, Cassie simply cannot listen to Marie's deluded portrayal of Michael any longer. Cassie knows that Michael was a lying worm like other men, and she also knows that Deirdre had seen her and Michael together, so she confesses to Marie that they had had an affair. Now the truth is out there, and, like a knife, it wounds. At first it seems that Marie isn't going to react, but the tension on stage builds until she screams at Cassie, get out of my house. The fact that these words are all written in capital letters emphasises the pain that facing up to reality has caused Marie. Number 12. A heavy plate raised to smash down. Marie lowers her arm. Marie has been depicted as a gentle, caring and kind person throughout the play until this point in scene four. The sheer despair that she feels on having the truth about Michael's philandering confirmed is clear when she behaves so differently from her normal self. She is on the point of committing a violent act, smashing a hard object down on her friend's head and the audience is on the edge of their seat. But then suddenly Marie lowers her arm, creating an immediate anticlimax. This dramatic climax and anticlimax make scene four highly memorable, as we can see how the uncovering of truths can be undesirable under certain circumstances. This seems counterintuitive to an audience, as we are generally brought up to tell the truth at all times. Number 13. I want the truth out of you. Deirdre doesn't care that the truth can hurt, and she's obsessed with finding out more about her father, even though it is bound to upset Marie. However, Marie already suspected the truth, as is clear when slightly later she admits to Deirdre, I knew who you were the first time I saw you. Given what Cassie has just confessed to her, and the fact that Deirdre even looks like Michael, Marie can no longer be in denial. Number 14. They don't want to be raging and screaming and hurting more than they can ever forget in the booze or the crack or the men beating men. This marks Marie's epiphany about the relationship between men and women all over the world, that they need each other and they need to understand each other. Men may be violent and come into conflict with women, but Marie acknowledges that men's lives aren't easy either, which is what gives rise to their frustration. Number 15. Your daddy was a man like any other. This is what Marie responds when Deirdre asks her, after the denouement, what her father Michael was like. Marie has now changed her description of Michael from what she used to respond to her two sons and this shows she's accepted that Michael was no saint and that he has deceived and betrayed her. 
not just with Cassie, but also with Deirdre's mother. However, Marie seems to come to terms with the realisation and invites Deirdre to stay for a cup of tea and feed the birds with her. She has grown and is able to face the truth calmly. In the other Bold Girls videos, we look at an overview of the play and previous eight mark questions. See you next time. If you found this or any of our other videos useful, it would be great if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks for your support.